now I am really happy to introduce Peggy Gulick. Peggy is the director of Smart Factory at Kohler, uh, the folks that make all of your uh, sinks and other uh, things that you see in your bathroom. So she's going to do a great talk called Digital Transformation, Still Loading, <laughs> a simple strategist guide to successfully augmenting human capabilities to drive scalable value. Oh my gosh, that is a mouthful, and she's got 20 minutes to do it. So let's, uh, let's see what we hear. So Peggy, come on up. Thank you. It's kind of weird to be back here, and unfortunately, I have the um, all the cool stuff here, and I'm always brought to do the practical presentation, right, on how we can make it useful in our workplaces. But um, I think I think we have some really some really fun stuff to talk about today. So um, they specifically asked me after PJ's uh, presentation on great statistics and where things are going to talk about the practicality of how we implement this now into our enterprise workplaces. So that's what I'm going to do. Oh, oh, there we go. Sorry. So, um, so from the agenda here, and, and it's written in your programs too, I'm going to focus heavily on um, there's no success without vision, right? Something that we all understand and know. Um, human augmentation, which is why I'm, I'm sure I'm invited to this show. And then the evolution versus revolution. So sort of the speed to get there and then how we sustain that as we move on. First, I'll talk a little bit about myself and uh, what my background is and why I'm even here um, being asked to speak to this. So started off as a English and art major, uh, went to computer science, got into the business and realized I love business processes and continuous improvement, N had no clue. Um, went into a company called Pure Fishing. Uh, they do fishing, Shakespeare, um, Shakespeare Berkeley, Abu Garcia, uh, were bought out by uh, Newell Rubbermaid. Um, so, you know, great, great company in small town Iowa. Left there to go to Agco to make tractors and combines and um, took on a digital transformation role. That's when it was, you know, sort of in the industry to be cool in the digital transformation side. And uh, then just was recently asked to come into Kohler and do Smart Factory. So the interesting piece is all of these companies approach it differently, but what I'm going to try to focus on today are the similarities that all three of those companies have had that really have allowed them to lead and um, be innovative and entrepreneurial in, in, um, in introducing these kinds of technologies. So the first piece is the vision and strategy. And I, I think it's really important here to understand that there's sort of a battle out there on top down, bottom up. And um, I don't think that's an or. I think it's an and to really be um, set up to be successful with this kind of transformation. So we start with the top, right? I mean, you have your leadership team who really is going to define the strategic business plan. Um, they're going to make sure they put nice guardrails up so that we can push some of this down um, to a different level um, on, the, on the vision spectrum. So they define the change that's needed, right? They really have to not only define it, they have to believe in it. And I'm sure there's people in here who understand the impact of that when they don't believe. And um, they have to have an innovative or agile organization, right? Another sort of um, key word that we have nowadays in delivering these things faster, um, not being in pilot purgatory when we bring solutions in. And then democratizing, right? Getting this down to the, the lower level. The second piece of that is the bottom up. So those closest to the actual function on the working floor really have the greatest ability to understand what the gap is to perfect, right? And then how to solve that. We just have to give them the right tools to do that. So, um, and they're really going to come up with that clear view. They're going to drive the action. And then we just have to make sure we have those metrics and things around it so that it is either a fail and we learn or a scale and we move forward. In the middle of that, so again, strategy down, goals up, right? This is like how we have to function so that we can get this broader ecosystem. So at Kohler, that's taking 30,000 people thinking innovatively, not 12 people sitting in a conference room trying to decide how we actually bring in cool technology, right? The really key point of this is, and had this at Agco, and also now at Kohler is that center of excellence, right? That thing that really keeps the communication flowing and makes sure that um, we're all speaking about the same priorities and, and how we're going to accomplish that. 
And the last piece I have on here is the, is the Hoshin Conry. So, you know, the process that we've had in my past and even now um, to make sure that we are aligned, you have to have something there to govern it uh, and really look into next year as to what you want to work on, what the priorities are. This I've learned really recently. So taking a brand new job, and I should have told everyone, I, I've been at Kohler for about seven months now. And um, coming in, I knew coming in how important from AGCO uh, having a strong culture, having a good infrastructure is to this type of technology, right? So, so I came in really trying to define what those weakest links are that can really sort of corrupt our ability to be successful. Obviously technology, and PJ spoke to that also, Right? The, um, I mean, if you have a great solution, but you don't have the ability, the bandwidth, the performance, or the connectivity, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die pretty quickly on that vine. We're also learning right now that when you introduce smart factory and digitalization, um, the importance of having uptime is even more critical than ever, right? 99.9999%, because otherwise, when it goes down, it's like your GPS in your car, when you're following it to get somewhere, and all of a sudden, it stops you don't know where we are, right? Because we're so dependent on these tools now. So we have plants right now that are advanced enough that if anything goes down on communication network, uh, they're really down in business, right? It's not like the old days where when it went down, you kept working and later came back in and then fed some information back into your system to make it current. Can't do that, right, when you get smart. People, obviously, the people side, and, and again, I still believe that technology is 20% of it and people's 80% of it, right? I mean, people really understanding how to drive these changes is critical to really sustain that. And, um, and, and empowering that workforce, again, 30,000 strong versus 12 strong, um, and then upskilling those people. And building change management into our HR teams, right? They're now part of our team coming in and helping us make sure that that change is, is relevant process, and this is just old school, right? Continuous improvement. I mean, I, I had in the quote that I had, you know, success is not final and failure is not fatal. I mean, we're never done, right? So this doesn't go away. It's just um, innovation gets added into our toolkit. And then strategy. And we talked a little bit about strategy, and um, it really comes back to that prioritization, making sure you have the data readiness, and then collaborative and meaningful metrics. And I think PJ talked a, a little bit about um, metrics changing, right? I think metrics will change when we go forward. And um, operationally right now, you know, throughput, quality, cost, labor efficiency, those are critical. But um, the ability to fail is going to be critical, right? So that we can be a little more innovative as these employees try to bring solutions into their workstations to make it um, more efficient. So I like this video. So, you know, the, the problem we have too, and here's where you uncool all the stuff here and you make it practical, right? Um, the hammer looking for the nail. And um, unfortunately, I think that most of the enterprise now has gotten past the just looking for the nail. Now we're trying to hammer screws in and we're trying to hammer in all kinds of things that aren't nails, right? Just to get that, that solution, that technology in. And it has to have a value or in the end, it's not, it's not gonna survive. Those are those pilots that go on forever. So again, this is just that process, and we all understand the continuous improvement process, and this is the same process that we're currently using, right? You have the strategy and performance piece where there has to be customer value. There has to be a problem, and there has to be customer value coming out of it. We have the skilled people, which is just um, ticked up a little bit for all of us. That upskilling of our people becomes um, technology and electronics and things that we didn't do before. They just had to come in and assemble or weld or fabricate. The efficient process and knowledge base, so that's got to be a sustainable innovation process, right? We have to understand what that process is so people know how to use it. Um, in my past life at AGCO, right, we used the Kaizen event just to come in and discuss those things and introduce, introduce that value. And then finally, that continuous improvement and um, change process. So the in internal and external partnerships are key here, right? How do we ask and vet if that's the right solution, if that changes, and then recognizing and rewarding. So I plugged into here a couple of other things that we've realized along the way are critical to this success. Personalization is hugely critical, whether it be because of generations coming in, new generations coming in, or whether it's just you take a worker and you say to them, I'm going to give you 70 work instructions, and they say, I've done this my whole life, I've never had a quality issue, why do I have to go through 70 instructions? 
but the new employee would, right? So we have to personalize these tools so people are only getting what they need when they need it, and machines are only getting what they need when they need it, right? They don't have to process through it. Come back to the center of excellence. I'll talk about our toolkit here, and that's just our circle of uh, continuous improvement then. So this is going to start leading us into the AR component. So if you're really using these, and again, I have my house under construction up there because I'm never sure it's really completely done. Um, it, it changes and standards change as we become more and more innovative. But you know, we're using the process on the digital side. We have what we call a, a rapid plant assessment. Anytime I walk into a plant, I can easily put on my colored glasses and figure out how how mature they are with infrastructure, how mature they are with culture, and then where that gap is to innovation so that I can help them focus on what they really, what they really need for solutions. The other side of that then on the right is really comes back to that governance and playbook, right? And again, that playbook is a changing document because there's so much that we're introducing um, as we go through these processes. That playbook also has a foundation underneath it, right? Our ERP systems, our MES systems, and all these other things we already have in place um, become part of that standardization that we depend on as we come in to put the solutions in. So some of the places that we're looking right now um, in the AR realm with uh, the digital strategy and our playbook, um, you know, we're looking at the digital twins, right? So taking on um, new product and um, R&D, we have uh, digital twins in our manufacturing assembly areas, um, any of our, our workstations. Uh, the VR, AR, and MR are really with that digital work instruction, which is being introduced on the uh, floors in the right places, right? Not everywhere. It's not appropriate everywhere. It has to have value. Um, the smart wearable devices, so we are working, and I'll show you a little bit about how we've been planning where to first implement those and what that value is that comes out of it. Smart torque tools, and then finally our logistics and vehicles, so AGVs and ASRS systems that we're building in. And a lot of these systems now are supported by the vendors, right, with remote assistance that's all through augmented reality, right, making all of us a little bit smarter and a little bit easier access to those people that can get us back up and running. So this is the toolkit, and this slide's been out there, seriously, I think I presented it probably here years and years ago. But you know, really, the way we've successfully looked at it um, in, in the, all the places that I've worked is, we're just adding more and more tools to this box, right, so that our 30,000 strong can come in and think this way as they come into their workstation and realize the things that aren't working, whether it's quality, right, whether it's an ergonomic thing, whether it's, um, literally the ability to reach that talk time, whether the standard work instructions are hard to see. So these are the things that we really want them to come back in and help us understand where that technology fits when they sit and do their own problem solving. I, I've always used as an example, a great example, and I know Rick Ryder's here today and worked with him at Agco, so I'm glad he's here because a lot of my knowledge and building of this came from Agco. But um, Agco actually has plants they shut down for an hour a week and allow the employees to problem solve, right? Bring in the tooling teams, bring in the maintenance teams, and actually problem solve. And, um, and this is the toolkit that they use, right? This is where they actually come to to, to find those solutions. This one is just a simple question for anyone who's really trying to sit back and say, gosh, how do you even start, start the process? So, right, keep it simple, stupid. You know, what problem am I solving? That's critical. That's critical to the success of these augmented and virtual tools and, and inform reality too. You know, who's going to use it? It has to be the right fit, right? You can't, everyone's not going to go out and use Google Glass to do their job. There, there's reasons to use it that, that reduce waste, and there's other reasons that, um, that, that it's not functional. The consequences if the technology isn't used correctly or abandoned, right? Back to my GPS in my car. If I'm dependent on that, really, how does that, how does that play out if you're not using it? Will the technology be threatening to the coworkers? I have had the question a lot of times, is your older workforce less apt to embrace it than your younger workforce? And my answer has become really simple, and I think Rick would agree. Anyone in the workplace who comes in to do a good job embraces these tools, right? Because they allow them to do quality first time. They allow them to meet their goals on that, on that floor. So, um, you know, we've had it embraced by everyone old, actually sometimes the older generations that have worked there for years and years, even more so than the younger, because they know the pain points that they've had where they couldn't get the information when they needed it, and a mistake happened that then had to be undone. 
and then the ergonomics and the safety considerations. So, you know, when we worked with our vendors um, introducing some solutions in the past at AGCO, um, we had the vendors come in and talk to the workers, right? Hey, how does it feel? How does it fit? When you're wearing glasses eight hours a day, does it hurt your nose? You know, how can we, how can we actually make that better for our employees, but not just have that liaison from us, literally have the vendors involved with our, our people who are coming up with the, the next generation of how to use and wear, and wear the solutions. And then how do you deploy at scale? And that's one of the big issues I think that, that um, it is difficult for a lot of places right, to get past. So here's my slide, and I just warned Rick. This is our AGCO slide. So this is where, um, this goes back to 2014, Rick, maybe 2016 was the last implementation. But um, putting Google Glass on the floor to do digital work instructions. Now again, behind the scenes of that is you have to have standard work instructions, right? So we worked on that really hard for every operation for more than one operator and how those balance. And then, and then basically um, getting the solution on the floor. You see the pictures. Um, when he looks down working, it actually the screen goes, goes quiet and then comes back in when he needs his next instruction. Um, on the floor. Also can give them bills of material for hardware that's line side, anything that they would need where they would have to walk to get that information and then come back again. Um, it, it, it got exaggerated when then in our Brazilian plants they decided to take it and use it for uh, TPM work um, on their machines in their machining, in their machining areas. So again, it perpetuates itself once people start realizing the results. The, the quality area um, really had a 35% reduction in uh, processing time, assembly 32, and training was reduced by 50%. Because once you taught everyone how to use the tools, um, all they needed to get was the instructions that really then um, enforced what they needed to do next. So the, next, the last piece of this really then comes back to rethinking at scale. So we look at all these companies with all these great ideas in the retail industry and the supply chain, and we think they're different, but they're really not. It's really, it's not how they went to market. It's really, um, in the end, um, the problem that they were trying to solve and, and, and how they did that innovatively. I look at Kohler right now, and our problem is a little bit different than what we had in the past. We put automation in in the past to reduce headcount. Right? Well, I don't think anyone is reducing headcount anymore. We can't get enough human people to come in and do all the jobs that we have. So, you know, one of the critical points we have right now is um, the employee experience and the value of that employee. So really augmenting that human on the floor so that they can do a better job and we supplement them where they need. This is some of the work we're doing on AR right now uh, with TeamViewer. And so you can see here, there's a long plan, uh, a, a long-term plan, but we're starting very focused, right? Started with remote assist, looking at that collaboration piece, going into electronic work instructions that are standalone. We'll then integrate those. We'll have then our, our AI workforce coming out of that. And finally, 3D simulations can come from this tool um, when we get all the way down the path to predict and prescribe. Right? So there's a plan, and we're starting slowly and making sure that along the way all of these, um, every, all the checkpoints are, are attended to so that we don't go to the cool factor and, and we haven't crossed off all the other things. So, so this is the critical piece for us right now, and I don't know how many other people share this, right? Um, those that are still asking why would I do this, I, I really truly sit down and look at the lack of employees that we'll have for manufacturing as we reshore, especially um, in 2035. And anyone who really wants to keep the doors open is going to have to find other ways to do things on their manufacturing floors. So, you know, it's no longer about reducing headcount, it's about um, actually upskilling our headcount and um, making sure that they have the tools they need to get the job done well. I think, you know, it's fun, too, to put that the cycle in there from Gartner. You know, they've, they've said since the beginning the connected workforce was critical to the success of how we're looking at these things going forward. So profits in the end, right? The not-so-soft wins. So for us, the place that we're really focusing this, because um, sometimes it's hard with these tools to come back in and say, this is the savings I will have, this is the benefit I will have, right? We're playing a little bit, trying to figure out how that fits. Um, but employee upskilling is a huge soft win, right? I mean, we have all of our employees now are being trained into technological, um, being able to control robots that are next to them or AGVs that are on the floor. Employer of choice, right? So I think PJ said it really well. The next generation coming in have been using cell phones and technology since the day they were born. So they're going to be looking for this kind of solution when they come into places like manufacturing to be able to use it. 
And then the sustain, sustainable competitive edge, right? You want to be the employer of choice. And, and I think especially when you look at these numbers of 7.9 million employee deficit going forward, um, that's critical. So in my last 30 seconds, this is really some of the things that we've done in the past at, at Agco and we're doing now at, at Kohler. Um, this is augmentation in our, in our factory floor. Um, pictures coming from the Agco um, solutions that got implemented with um, the ability to see your work instruction and uh, images that support it. And that is it. So changing continuous in improvement into continuous innovation, DSIP, um, is really where we're headed, digital continuous innovation processes. Um, and, and again, I think we all say and hear all the time, you know, think big, but start small so that you can, you can really prove that out, vet it, and then uh, scale it bigger. That's all I have. All right. Thank you so much, Peggy. That was incredible. So we've got about five minutes for questions. I see a bunch of hands go up. All right. Let's do, uh, you're the closest to me. So go ahead. Uh, so what methods do you use to assess and address gaps in your culture adopting innovation? The in the culture piece? So yeah. that's a great question. Um, you know, it, it's kind of funny because they're quite simple. We've, we've introduced them into our, our internal audits of all of our plants now, right? So not just that rapid plant, but being able to go through and understand it. Um, it's, it's really simple questions of, you know if there's an innovative culture because they have the platforms to build it on. So if you don't have the infrastructure ready, right, no employee in that plant is going to be thinking of doing something that needs Wi-Fi every time I move from station to station, right? So we're focusing in on those pieces. But then on the culture side, um, I think it really comes back to just understanding these things we just talked about. And you'll be really surprised if you're sitting in these Kaizen events um, when they start thinking out of the box, right? So the solution we had with the glass at Agco, they, um, I think, Rick, you could even answer this one too, but the quality team wanted to stop walking to a computer so they got tablets. Then they kept rolling over them with tractors because they'd leave them on the treads and forget they were there and roll them over. So now this became an IT problem. The IT team then came back and said, this is crazy, we're going to duct tape their tablets to them or we could use Google Glass. And they were kind of laughing, ha, ha, ha. And I said, go ahead, $1,200 to vet something like that? So it's really simple when you walk around and talk to the employees, not the people at the top, but the employees, to find out how they're thinking about solving those problems, right? Okay, next question. I really appreciate your talk. Thank you very much. I feel like I could ask hundreds of questions. Uh, the first one, or the only one I'll ask, um, has to do with the tool set. I'm curious, uh, the different groups you've worked for, um, you know, to go from CAD to PDM to MES, you need all these tools to talk to one another. And, and I, I wanted your opinion are, um, and what you've seen in the past. It, are there are there companies out there that can do everything under one roof, or are you finding the best solutions and then building the integration between? Like that's what, a great question, and I don't have a really clean answer because everything is a little bit um, different as we go through the analysis, right? But you're right. So so those core systems we've learned they need to get while we're working forward parallel into innovation. They, we need to to lean those out, right? They're really fat, heavy layers. So the thing that sort of impedes innovation is if it's going to take nine months to test something because it takes that long to plug it in and to get the security approval and to do all that kind of stuff, it, it, it never happens, right? It just, it just, it falls off the plate. So, you know, we've asked in my last company and this company, leaning out those standard systems, making those layers thinner, but the platform piece is critical, right? When do you bring the platform in-house so that that data lake is ours and we can plug anything into it? And, and when do you actually go out to a company and bring that in very specific to a tool, like an AGV or a, right, as you do that? And um, I think we're getting really better at balancing that when you bring it in. And sometimes it's just really based on cost, right? It's like to, to build that, that thought process of iOS, Android, Windows, and Google Glass all have to be able to plug into this thing. Um, you know, sometimes it's the, the cost of doing the development is better bringing it in-house. And I think the other piece that, that really we're defining right now is where do you put the guardrails on and then give it to the plants? Because it's their p and I don't know about you guys. For me, every company I've been at, the plants own their own P&L. They buy these solutions, right? So they're off buying them down the street versus trying to stay standardized. So where do, we cut, where do we draw that line so that the SCADAs and the PLCs and the OT solutions become the plants 
because we've built them a foundation that allows them to do that, right? They can come in and fail in two weeks, learn from it, and try something else. Or bring the vendor in from down the street safely without going through six months of security questions um, trying to get that solution in. So it's a great question. I don't have all the answers to it, but I think we're really getting closer to being able to do that. Okay, so we've got, I think, time for two more questions. So go ahead. On your second to last slide, I think you had something like a picture that said reskilling versus upskilling. What would, what would you say is the main difference there? I, I saw that and it kind of uh, piqued my interest. Yeah, good question. Let me go back to my slide if I can. Uh, I'm not going backwards. Um, so, so I think it's the same question. It's, it's very versed in what we were just talking about. When do we need to upskill, retrain the employees, and when can we reskill what's currently on the plant floor to a better level? The funnier question that comes into that, I remember as I was putting that together, you know, you can, you can over quality things, right? How many people have checkpoints in a plant where, um, we do, we had a sensor in an area where um, the, the, if the bins ran out or the, the silos ran out of the chemical and um, the alarm would go off. And so the first question I had was kind of, how often does that happen? Well, it's never happened. Okay, so we have to stay a little bit focused too on what we currently have, where the actual problem is, and not over, over compensating on either the skilling or the solutioning, right? And I, th I think that's a piece of using what we already have, but you don't have to take it to that next level of upskilling the humans to be technically, technologically advanced to be running robots and EGVs, right? There's, other, there's a lot of other things we can do better um, that don't have to actually hit that, that upskill met method. Okay, I think we have time for one more, and I think you went your hand up, so. Hi, my name's uh, Andrew, I'm with Lockheed Martin. I, I had a oh. question about the video that you showed on the manufacturing floor about them having, on the Google Glasses, you pressed a button and it had a graphic that popped up. Is that like a PowerPoint graphic that pops off to the side, or is it like an actual AR thing that gets overlapped with the, with the part? And then when you hit proceed, does that automatically buy off in the MES integration or in, in the MES system? That's a great question. Do you mind taking the microphone over to Rick, who can answer this really clearly? Because uh, he actually owned this. He stand, yeah, there he is. He actually owned this solution for us at Agco, so and had some really incredible stuff done in that in that solution. It, the layer in between the hardware, which is what the cool factor is, and the tool was a digital execution system. And I think that he can speak to that. Yeah. So the image came from our, our standard work instruction set. So it was displayed using a Perseux application on the Google Glass hardware. So they're just looking at a static image up there. Uh, we did some testing and bought videos and overlays, and for the type of builds, it was taking too much time for the worker to watch a video or to match an overlay than the value of just add, b keep building. So we consider it like a, like a Lego work instruction, like here's a simple graphic. Once I've done it 10, 12 times, I probably just look at it and say, oh yeah, put this on next, and they don't need the detail. Um, so it's more like a PowerPoint, but it's a bit more dynamical. It changes based upon the machine coming down the assembly line and how it's configured. And then, yes, um, once they proceed off that task, um, that signed it off on MES. So every, every assembly step was checked as done, time stamped, uh, or, or not done. If they had a, a quality defect, they would send an action and, and, and it would workflow yep. off to be solved later. Yep, it'll send the non-conforms. I mean, in that case, too, that digital execution system is the wow factor, right? That's the connection point that, and I, th I believe, um, and, and you can talk to Rick afterwards, but um, the SAP implementation in that plant, they actually laid on top of it that digital execution system because um, it, it's compliant with, you know, Windows and iOS and Android, not just Glass, right? That's just a solution that you can use as your hardware device in the job that you're, you're currently doing. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, so much. And thanks again, Peggy, for a fantastic talk. Thank you.